Once, in their youth, the light shone for them. They saw the light and followed the star, but then came reason and the mockery of the world. Then came faint-heartedness and apparent failure. Then came weariness and disillusionment. And so they lost their way again. They became blind again. Some of them have spent the rest of their lives looking for us again, but could not find us. They have then told the world that our league is only a pretty legend and people should not be misled by it. During the spring of 2020, I had a dream in which I was living in a bleak 1984 type Orwellian world. I'd got a secret meeting planned with a friend in a nearby park. We were going to read one of the books that had suddenly become banned. It was very reminiscent of the scene in Orwell's dystopia where the couple meet to secretly read Shakespeare and where the girl puts on lipstick, also forbidden. The book I had brought with me in the dream, though I had no clue until I pulled it from my bag, was Journey to the East by Herman Hesse. First published in 1932, it charts the course of a mystical journey that transcends both time and space and which includes illustrious participants like Plato, Mozart, Pythagoras, Socrates and modern artists like Paul Klee and Tristan Klingsor. Rather unwittingly, it seems, H.H., the protagonist, a humble choir master, becomes part of a great clandestine company called the League. Each traveller has his or her own unique goal, their own heart's desire, their own light toward which they are powerfully drawn. H.H. himself seeks the beautiful Princess Fatima, we move toward the east, he tells us, but we also travelled into the Middle Ages and the Golden Age. We roamed through Italy and Switzerland, but at times we also spent the night in the 10th century and dwelt with the patriarchs or the fairies. Sometimes they would meet other questers along the way and they would be great golden days of feasting and sweet celebration with music and poetry and deep camaraderie. Dreamlike days that H.H. cherished. Days when the company was united and free and wonderfully inspired. At other times, the travellers went on alone, each following their own unique course. I also walked alone at times, he tells us, without a tent, without a leader, without a speaker. And during such times, I often found again the places and people of my own past. Sometimes, my company consisted of the beloved characters of my books, Almansor, Parsifal, Whitico, or Goldmund, rode by my side, or Sancho. When I found my way back to our group, in some valley or other, heard the league songs, and camped by their leaders' tents, it was immediately clear to me that my excursions into my childhood and my ride with Sancho 
belonged essentially to this journey. For our goal, he tells us, was not only the East, or rather the East was not only a country and something geographical, it was the home and youth of the soul. It was everywhere and nowhere. It was the union of all times. But then somehow the dream was fractured and no one knew quite how or why. There were rumours of betrayals and the disappearance of an especially beloved companion. Afterwards, everything began to unravel. The company disbanded, and many of the travellers ceased in their endeavours. In the end, it seemed like only H. H. remained, and only he remembered. Yet as time passed, even his memories began to dwindle, and fade, and fearing that the story might be lost altogether, he resolved to set it down in a great history of the League and the journey. And yet, the more he tried to capture it, to faithfully set it down, the more he became estranged from its magic. And when he looked back to the wondrous days at the very peak of his experience, he was riddled with doubt. Did they even really happen? Everything becomes questionable as soon as I consider it closely, he explains. Everything slips away and dissolves. But there's a clever twist in the tale, you see. For it turns out that the League hasn't disbanded at all, it's just H.H. who's fallen out of alignment with it. It's still there, still going on, in all its wonder. And this is the great surprise, the lesson and insight of the tale. Forgetfulness afflicts us all, of course, especially as we grow especially when times are hard, or even just mundane, and we too fall out of alignment with our dreams, with what Jung called the archetype of the child, the golden one within. And of course, there's nothing greater than fear and doubt to drive this part of the self into the shadows. So, what does it mean to dream about such a book at such a time as this? And what does Hess's choice of travel companions reveal about his times and theirs? Fellow travellers like Plato famously called attention to the dangers of Orwellian style regimes in his Allegory of the Cave, in which chained prisoners are subjected to a continual stream of propaganda from which they cannot turn away. His teacher Socrates was driven from his beloved Athens for allegedly corrupting the young with misinformation no doubt or its classical equivalent. And at his trial he was deemed a threat to democracy and sentenced to death. And certainly, looking into the biographies of Hesse's contemporaries on the journey, links quickly became apparent which threw the relationship between the journey to the East and 1984 into a whole new light. For it soon became clear that Hess together with several of his semi-fictional companions, had, in real life, suffered under the Nazi regime of the 1930s and 40s. Hitler rose to power midst a great blossoming of modern art. Artists, 
writers, musicians, analysts and scientists were all busy pushing the boundaries of what had gone before, blurring the edges, you might say, peering beneath the surface, exploring the inner world, challenging accustomed ways of thinking and perceiving. Many of these people expressed anti-war sentiments too. Psychoanalysis was flourishing, especially in Germany and neighbouring countries. And in physics too, even the core Newtonian assumptions had been quietly overturned by game-changing developments in quantum theory. Hitler distrusted all of this. Believing such developments partly responsible for Germany's economic troubles and what he saw as moral decline. He wanted to return the nation to its former glory, to its trusted traditional values. And to this end, he orchestrated a series of book burnings across university campuses. Paul Klee found himself amongst an increasing number of university academics sacked and disgraced. And in 1937, 17 of his previously acclaimed paintings were displayed at the infamous Nazi Degenerate Art Exhibition in Munich where observers were encouraged to ridicule and pour scorn on the exhibits. Hess himself tried to rise above the fray when the crackdowns first began, and he tried to warn German intellectuals to retain their humanity, to turn away from the increasingly aggressive nationalist and popularist rhetoric that was spreading throughout the population like fire. Oh friends, he wrote in an article at the outbreak of war, not these tones. But it wasn't long before he too became blacklisted, partly because his wife was Jewish and partly because of his association with Freud with whom he had been in analysis. In a letter reprinted in the Jewish press, the Nazi condemnation of him is clear. Once and for all, it must be made public that Hess is a classic example of how the Jew can poison the soul of the German people. For if at that time, when he took no delight in the war, he had not fallen into the clutches of the Jew Freud and his psychoanalysis. He would have remained the German writer we all loved so well. The warping of his soul can only be ascribed to this Jewish influence. Throughout the entire war, and from the relative safety of his home in Switzerland, Hess supported numerous German artists and refugees, including Thomas Mann and Bertolt Brecht, as they fled from persecution. Tragically, however, he couldn't save his wife's immediate family, all of whom were murdered in concentration camps, a horror, we are told, that haunted him for the rest of his life. Carl Jung intimated of those times that Germany was undergoing some kind of a collective psychosis and retrospectively it seems to have been so. For those who didn't escape, those who were effectively silenced and broken, trapped within the nightmare. The journey to the East, the journey beyond time and space, 
must have seemed as if it had indeed been just a pretty legend. Was it even still there? Was it even still going on? The hope is that it was in some way, that it always is, no matter what, which was surely the reason Hess tried to warn his contemporaries not to get drawn in, not to get overshadowed and forget, like his own character H. H. had done. He wanted to remind them that the dream is eternal, always here, always now, however crazy or naive that might seem, even for those dear ones who so tragically lost their lives. And maybe this is why The Journey to the East was the book the dreamer took to the secret meeting, because it points a way back out of darkness, to the return of innocence and wonder, to the home and youth of the soul, everywhere and nowhere, as Hess so eloquently wrote, to the union of all times. Almost all modernist art, such as Impressionism and Expressionism, was considered degenerate art by the Nazi regime. And much modern music, such as jazz and swing, was also barred as degenerate music. Jewish composers like Mendelssohn and Schoenberg were also banned. Amongst those authors and artists who were suppressed, both during the Nazi book burnings and the attempt to destroy modernist fine art in the Degenerate Art Exhibition were Ernest Hemingway, Bertolt Brecht, Thomas Mann, John Dos Passos, H. G. Wells, Franz Kafka, Pablo Picasso, Claude Monet, Vincent van Gogh, Gustav Mahler, Felix Mendelssohn, Arnold Schoenberg, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Edmund Herschel, Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, Frederick Nietzsche, and Sigmund Freud. These artists, writers, musicians and scientists, together with all those from times gone by, are all part of this eternal journey. All luminaries, all following their own unique star amidst a great collective forgetting. Diamonds in the night, as the poet sings, all along down the ancient highway. Thank you.